Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Speed Bumps Live, April 23rd. How's it going, Paul? It's going great. I'm in the office and you're not. I'm, I'm not in the office today, man. I know. I know. I know. Yeah. I'm here by myself. I think I'm going to be kind of like uh, uh, Tom Hanks and Big and just run around and play <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. It's like the Macaulay Culkin thing, right? At home, it's just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just like <laughs> yeah. Hey, real quick, I wanted yeah. to make a, a little announcement and say happy birthday. Happy birthday. Bumps. That's right. Yeah. Happy birthday. It's one That's year. That's right. One year speed bumps live. And uh, thanks to everyone who has helped us make it this far. Uh, you know, all our great attendees and guests. This has been a fantastic ride and we're, we're still having a great time doing it. So thanks, you guys. Yes. Thank you very much. So I guess happy birthday to you as well, Paul. <laughs> Awesome. And thanks, you guys, for joining today. For those of you guys that are joining us for the very first time, welcome to Speed Bumps Live. Uh, we're a bi-weekly web show that discusses marketing challenges and opportunities with leaders from different industries. I'm Javier Santana. And I'm Paul Carpenter. And before we get started, I want to quickly mention that while we have the chat feature off, we will be doing Q&A towards the end of the segment. So please use the ask feature, ask question feature at the bottom. Um, and we will be answering as many of the questions as we can. So um, it's always best to have audience participation. And we will have um, our Q&A moderator, our very own Shannon Delaney. Hey, Shannon. All right. Hi, everybody. Happy Looking. birthday, Speed Bumps. I know, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, real quick, Hav, who do we got uh, today? Yeah, so today we have a really awesome and very special guest. Uh, today we're going to be talking to Brian Carden. He's the CMO of Envision. Uh, brilliant, brilliant, uh, and very seasoned marketer with 20 plus years of experience. Uh, he's done marketing for startups, large corporations, and he has a knack for marketing technology. Been a C-level executive of several tech companies, including Fuse, Eloqua, Forrester Research. Um, currently at Envision, he's leading sales, customer success, support, and marketing to bring creatives together in design collaboration. So remember, right? Sales, customer success, support, and marketing. He's leading all those teams together, which is some of the conversation we're gonna to have today. Uh, Brian's an incredible marketer, well-respected executive, uh, been named Forbes uh, 50 most influential CMOs, since uh, uh, 30 tech marketing leaders uh, changing the industry, business insiders, 20 executives shaping the future of marketing, so much more. I mean, uh, Brian, can you please join us so we can just applaud you? Great to be here. I'm exhausted just hearing all that stuff, uh, but also happy anniversary. What a great uh, year you guys have had. And uh, this is an amazing series. And thank you for bringing it to the entire marketing community. It's awesome. Oh, to see. And, and thank you for joining us. So this is a fantastic uh, guest for our one year anniversary. So absolutely. Thank you, very thank much. you so much. Thank yeah. you. Um, and real quick, Brian, for everybody um, that that's joining us, you're up in Boston. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So as we get going, um, like we normally do, we like to dig in a little bit um, and spend a little time on the background while Hav read off a lot um, and of your esteemed career. We do want to take a few minutes and at least for those uh, maybe one or two people that don't know much about Envision, go ahead and tell us a little bit about who Envision is, who are your customers and a little bit of background about yourself. and we power some of the greatest digital customer experiences in the world. We're very fortunate to have 100% of the Fortune 100 as clients. We've got sort of digital natives, so everything, whether it's the app from Airbnb or Bank of America or Uber, it was built on our platform, um, and that's really great, and we're just doing really well. It helps designers collaborate around the world. Um, I'm a career marketer. I've always loved marketing. I love the left brain and the right brain. I love the creativity that marketers have always brought, being great storytellers and being high with the narrative and compelling conversations with customers. But I also love the data side. Uh, my father was a scientist and I just love digging into data. And um, that's what makes me really excited about marketing. Um, right after business school, I joined a large consulting firm and I started specializing in um, marketing issues for consumer products, which is what I don't do now although we have 7 million users, it feels like a consumer product, but Coca-Cola, Heinz, Campbell's Soup, a lot of very well-known consumer brands that I worked on for a long time. Um, we had twin boys and I didn't wanna travel. As you might imagine, the life of a consultant is you travel all the time. 
And uh, I got a job uh, offer for a, a large company called Reed Elsevier, got a $5 billion company, hundreds of people in the marketing team. So um, unlike most marketers, I didn't really grow up in marketing. I was a consultant, really good with slides and analysis. And then I suddenly became a CMO with a, an extremely large global marketing team. Uh, so that was sort of the introduction. I worked at very large organizations and smaller startups. And um, I just really have a good time with marketing. That's, that's fantastic. By the way, we use Envision at launch and it is a fantastic product. And, and I've always been uh, such a fan of, of these really um, great collaboration tools. And it seems like you guys were always ahead of what a lot of people were trying to do. And we're going to get dig into that a little bit, but I want to talk about your role today because it's really unique. Um, you're a product led company. Um, that means that you guys operate differently. That means that you're creating culture differently. You're constantly keeping in communication and collaboration, and, and you guys have always been 100% distributed since the very beginning. And I believe you have 10 years now. Is that correct? Yeah, about 10 years. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, we started, you know, our belief is that the screen is the most important place. We're doing mm -hmm. everything on screens now, and clearly COVID has accelerated that. But we've always been a fully distributed. We have zero offices. We've never had offices. Wow. So, Paul, looking where you are, just running around there is, I love being with people, but um, we've decided to go fully distributed and believe the screen is the right way to go. And uh, so it's it's quite different. One of the largest companies in the world that has always been uh, fully distributed. We don't call it remote because no one person is remote. Everyone right. is equal. And sometimes we find that when there's a corporate headquarters, then people are working from home. They're second class citizens. So in our world, everyone is exactly the same. We're all working from home. There's no central office. There's no, I'm here at the office, you're not. And so I think that really changes the dynamic quite a bit when everyone is equal. You know, and that's actually a really valid point and interesting because as folks start transitioning back to the office, um, there are folks that will not want to come back in, right? I think that now, you know, we've, we've kind of leveled the playing field to the point where yes, we will have fully distributed teams and we'll have folks that will want to collaborate, but nobody should ever feel like they're a second class citizen of sorts because they just have a family to take care of, or they just prefer to work remote for whatever reason. So that's really great that you guys did that really early on. Um, but you're also fortunate where you guys came in 10 years ago, technology was really at a point where it was um, very usable to that extent, right? So, you know, you talked about how technology enables better work um, in today's climate, right? But now we're looking at um, a lot of more advanced technology like uh, AI, right? That's a, uh, influencing our buying decisions, uh, smarter ways to provide uh, product support. Um, and then, you know, you have this overwhelming nature of, you know, too much communication in, in the work days. Uh, you know, somebody said to me, you know, the thing about working remote that they didn't like was that they wake up and go to sleep at work every day. <laughs> right. So how do you, how do you balance that? How do you create some, some sort of harmony between what could potentially be chaotic? Yeah, it's very challenging. Um, we don't have kids in the house anymore, but can you imagine, having a full-time job, have a bunch of kids, feeling you're neither a good employee nor you're a good parent, uh, the pressure of the pandemic. And so I think we have to have a lot of empathy for employees. We never know what their challenges are. You know, on Zoom, you can put up a good face, but all the evidence suggests that you don't get the full body language. You don't really know what's going on. So I think taking the time to get to know people and what their personal struggles are. I think mm -hmm. depression is just a huge issue that's rampant that very few people talk about. Um, certainly for children who are isolated from their, their playmates and their colleagues at, at, yeah. at school. And certainly for all of us, you know, I miss being with a team. Um, I wasn't able to hug my kids for almost a year. Now I can, and we finally had dinner together, but we all have these issues, these quiet moments of desperation. Um, I'm hoping it makes us all better and appreciate each other much more. Um, and hopefully we've been able to learn how to operate better in a distributed way. Um, but it's been a very challenging time for all of us, I think. And we sometimes don't express the empathy to our teams of how difficult it's been over the past year. Yeah, it's, it's really crazy. And, and I'll, so let me ask you this. How do you see, um, obviously, technology being able to connect is, is fascinating, right? Because had this happened 30 years ago, it would have been much difficult uh, pandemic to the scale. But when you start really talking about technology, the evolution, and how you guys are utilizing it and what you're seeing... How do you feel like technology is going to help you as a company evolve? Or what are you already seeing that is changing the way that we operate, right? I remember yeah. last time we had spoken, um, you had mentioned the whole uh, conversation around Vivino, I believe it was, right? And how folks are really now 
not necessarily talking to a human to get the information that they need. So, so uh, your daughter being a sommelier, can you uh, remind us a little bit about that story and uh, tell us a little bit more about the future of uh, technology? Yeah, great questions. Uh, you know, I will say with technology, the biggest thing is we have vaccines. Like yeah. who would have thought it? Like vaccines take years and years and we always knew a pandemic was gonna come, but we never knew that technology and multiple bets and also a lot of collaboration I was looking at um, who's won the Nobel Prize in different sciences, and 20 years ago, a single person won. Huh. And then over the last five years, multiple winners in different parts of the world. So someone in, you know, in Brazil and someone in the United States and someone in the Philippines are all collaborating now. And mm -hmm. so I think we're able to move a lot faster with vaccines, with uh, new sort of, uh, you know, uh, mathematics, physics, and all these areas, we're seeing much greater collaboration because of the technology. Um, and we're seeing amazing strides, as you mentioned, in artificial intelligence. If I was advising people about careers, uh, of course, I'm in sales and marketing, I would say you may not want to be a salesperson. Uh, we're seeing, I love salespeople, but let's face it, there's so many categories where those people have disappeared. I'm old enough to remember a travel agent. What a novel idea that was. And Here's the best travel agent in the world. And my daughter is a sommelier and that's a real service business where you talk about the wine and everything. Sometimes she'll go to a table and she'll talk to them about wine and she'll start talking to them. And they say, oh, Isabel, you don't really have to tell us we have the Vivino application, we can look here. And so there are all sorts of interesting um, careers um, that are being usurped by artificial intelligence or really uh, the collective wisdom um, which would be thousands of people writing reviews. Um, you don't need a travel agent because you can look at TripAdvisor and see all the reviews. And there's just so many uh, examples of that happening. And in sales too, mm -hmm. um, we used to have a very large customer support team of people. And uh, we started moving much more towards automation. A lot of commonly asked questions are now automated answer, bots on the website, et cetera. And I was afraid, I was afraid that humans wanna talk to other humans. Well, boy, was I wrong. <laughs> like, it's so much more efficient to just talk to a bot and get the answer right away. And so if the goal is to have a great customer experience, very often the great customer experience is not a human to human experience, but a human working with a machine or a bot that has the collective knowledge of thousands and thousands of transactions. And it's sort of a new way to think. Um, you know, all these categories have sort of, you know, gone the way of, of bots, but I think sales is going that way. I think home selling, you know, we can see that um, Zillow is now selling homes, obviously Tesla, uh, you don't, you can get a test drive, but there's no salespeople. A lot of categories that we always thought um, you had to have a human being sell, we're really pushing it that consumers can do their own research, they can self-select and they can do the transaction as well. It's, it, 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 it's accelerated so much over the last couple of years. That's amazing. Paul's a little old school. I think he likes dialing a number and having the 19 options to, to route his call to somebody specific, right? <laughs> I, I love it. And I love it when the cord actually gets all kinked up. That's the best. That's the best part. Um, hey, listen, that, this is um, already super, super fascinating. And I want to try to pivot it into um, Envision now a little bit. And I want to talk about your role as CMO, and I'm going to throw out some stats. Okay, so, so bear with me for a second, because I want to lead up to this. Um, but basically, you know, Hav kicked us off with all of the elements that, that, are, that are under your umbrella. And, um, and at first, I, I was expecting three Brian Cardins to come on, um, because I don't know how you do it. Um, but this is a, this is a really good um, conversation around harmony and how marketing sales and customer service are all under a single customer experience function. And what we've seen is Gartner is saying that by 2023, 25% of companies will have this CX function, kind of a singular function. But that means there's 75% of companies who aren't aligning all of these things. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the importance of this and maybe how you've been able to implement it? Yeah, um, I've always been a head of marketing and I love to work with sales. And then um, about a year ago, our CEO and founder Clark called me and said, Brian, I'm going to make a change in sales. 
And of course, what do I think? Oh, the guy who's running sales, I love, you're going to fire him. And he said, no, we're not going to let him go. Sales now reports to you. And uh, the biggest laugh was my wife. She's the vice president of sales. And she said, now you're going to count your, your life in quarters. There's a number on your back. You know, and she, I would always hear her conversations about how the leads suck. And I would always tell her, you guys aren't following up. It was sort of the classic, you know, couple sales and marketing. But this word you mentioned, alignment, is interesting because we don't just have alignment. We have complete integration because sales, marketing, support, customer success are all sort of together. And so there's no finger pointing at all. Um, and there are a couple reasons for that. Um, the marketing team is completely committed to pipeline and closed one business. So I think we've all been in organizations where at the end of the quarter, marketing rings the bell. Look at our MQLs. We crush the leads. And the sales team is all slumped down saying we missed our number. You know, And that's a sad place to be. And of course, it's been reversed too, where marketing misses their MQLs and sales kill crushes their bookings number. But in our organization, we have a common goal, which really unites everyone and it's fully integrated. We get some of our best marketing campaign ideas from salespeople. Um, we have a editorial council where marketing doesn't decide what content we create. We've got a whole bunch of salespeople on there. They're saying, I need more bottom of funnel, or I need more of this or more of this. And so it's completely um, integrated and it feels terrific. It feels terrific and very, very new motion. Um, also for me, as the leader of these organizations, I feel new energy. Like I've been a career CMO for a long time and I got my playbook and I bring out my playbook and sometimes I come up with new plays, but this has been a very energizing experience for me. And I feel like a kid again. It's really been a lot of fun. This is it's awesome. phenomenal. Yeah, this is, uh, this is pure magic, by the way. Um, and when we talked earlier and we talked about this alignment and it's not alignment, it's integration. First off, I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, is there any advice uh, that you have out there for people who might be um, wanting to integrate this, but are kind of bumping their heads up against the wall going, uh, how do we not, you know, how do we get the C-suite uh, to, to see this? Um, how do we get them to uh, kind of take the, the customer journey and kind of pull it all together? Do you have some advice to share for influencing C-suite? I do. Um... A few years ago, I was looking at the customer experience and I created a war room of all the artifacts. So here's the marketing content. We printed everything out and put it on the wall. Here's what prospects see first. Here's the conversations they're having with salespeople in the decks. Here's what they see on the website. Here's the onboarding when they become a customer. Here's the product experience. And we looked across the wall. It looked like they came from seven different companies. Yeah. And so the expectations that marketing set were not met by the sales team. It was a different conversation. And then when they finally bought and they were onboarded, they met new people that had new things to say that they had never heard before. And so, you know, this idea of music and uh, harmonization really matters. Yeah. So you got to make sure that customers are not jolted. They feel that they bought from one organization and the promises made at the beginning of the sales process, the journey continues throughout, not just once they buy, but post-purchase. And, and the customer experience uh, when they're using the product. So that really, so that's a big thing. It can be very jarring to see all the different messages and the customer doesn't even remember. And, you know, they're shopping with many different vendors. And so it's a way to really stand out, to have great consistency. Isn't it wonderful if the marketing messages they saw in an email or a webinar were paid off perfectly when they finally spoke to the rep, the rep knew, mm -hmm. you know, and it perfectly lined up there. And so that's where we try to get to. So that's one thing. Um, and I think the second issue is um, they ought to look at the data, which suggests that really tight alignment or integration between sales, marketing, success, support um, has higher performance. Um, and uh, Serious Decisions, now part of Forrester, they have really good data on this. McKinsey has really good data. And so the companies that have the best alignment and integration between marketing and sales dramatically outperform companies where they're in silos. And we've all been part of organizations where there's that finger pointing going on. And... Uh, the finger here only points <laughs> to the me, one person. <laughs> which is fine because I can make change happen because I've got all the pieces of the puzzle. You know, you started talking about how just like uh, going into like a war room and, and putting everything, looking at the different conversations that are happening. As you were saying that, I can only imagine Shannon sitting there trembling in her seat, dying to jump in this conversation because her and I have had conversations about something very similar where she's experienced that. 
looking at how so many different conversations happen and it really does feel like you're from different companies. Yeah. So yeah, that's a really important task. I mean, as simple as it may seem, a really important task for folks to do is really look at how the whole company is, is speaking about whether it's product or service to make sure that you're completely aligned. A lot of folks don't take the time to do that. You know what's so interesting? Each person at the company along the way is doing their job, what they think is the best way. Okay. So, you know, the marketing team has a great paid landing page and their forms and their webinars. The sales team has their scripts and their enablement. Like everyone believes they're doing the right job, but no one's looking over the whole thing. Right. And uh, you can have much higher performance. What we've seen is much higher velocity going through. So we were sort of mm -hmm. tracking in my last company uh, from opportunity to closed one. And when we sort of aligned much better, we saw a much faster velocity of opportunities moving along because they didn't get to a stage where they heard new things. It was like the very things they heard at the beginning, they heard later, it just reinforced what the points of differentiation and why they were gonna buy. But if you start hearing noise and new things, you, you sort of stop and say, hmm, that was a little bait and switch. I heard something over here and it's different right. from here. So I think the sales velocity thing is, is really important metric to watch. Do you, given that you're product led, do you feel that you're either in an advantage or a disadvantage in pulling all of these things together? We, we sort of operate both ways. So we have a bottoms up motion where we have 7 million people using our app and it's like a Dropbox or a Slack or you know, any of these things where people you know, download. Uh, that then becomes sort of leads uh, if they're from an enterprise and they're using it, then the sales team sort of calls on those individual users, the product-led growth leads, to sort of take them up to an enterprise sale. So we have both a bottoms-up and a tops-down approach. Um, I will say that the great thing about product-led is that uh, there's no noise in the system. You can see everything perfectly. Uh, you know, once you get salespeople talking, you don't really understand why you're won or lost or why the deal stopped. But we can see precisely, like, we couldn't convert them from free to paid because they abandoned the product or they stopped using it here. Or they found us through paid search, they got to a landing page, and they never converted, they abandoned. You know, why did they abandon there? Oh, there was too much friction to get them to the product. Or once they're in the product, they hit a wall or they different things. So I love this idea of science. We have a completely contained environment, and it's very pure, and uh, you don't have a lot of distractions. Once you go into the wild west here with salespeople and advertising and a whole bunch of things. So I love sort of this, this all the data, it's all in one place through the product led growth process. Well, and speaking of data, um, you know, who loves data is typically the CFO, right? They yeah. love to, they love to see those numbers. So um, do you have any advice around that? Because you had, you had, you had given yeah. us some really good advice um, that we had heard from one of our previous guests uh, last season. Uh, but I, I think it's worth reinforcing um, to talk about how you, uh, how you approach that sort of. Yeah, most marketers really fear the CFO. It's like they're there to cut the budget and they avoid them at all costs. And of course, the natural partnership is between the head of sales and the head of marketing. What I found is that early on, if you partner up with the CFO, you ask them to vet the metrics you're using. Uh, you, they feel ownership of marketing because you know one day the CEO is gonna turn to the CFO and say, hey, what do you think of the marketing team? Are they spending our money well? Are they good stewards of the brand? Are they wasting money? And you wanna make sure that the CFO is saying, wow, they're doing a great job. They're very responsible. In fact, you wanna give them more money because we're getting a great return. And so if marketing does all of their own metrics there's a little suspicion. And so I've always partnered up with finance, FP&A, financial planning and analysis to come up with some of the metrics. And some of the metrics, like for example, cost per lead or cost per opportunity, there's not a standard way to do it. Um, some people look at just the program costs. Some people look at all of marketing costs. Um, there's also not standardization on CAC, cost of acquiring a customer or lifetime value, LTV. And so these are the kind of metrics that I would go to finance and say, hey, let's work together to come up with a common set of metrics to measure marketing's performance. And once you nail that down, you really have earned a lot of trust and they're the keeper of the numbers. And, and sometimes I talk about this idea of you have to go slow to go fast. So slow down a little bit, get your numbers right, work with finance, and then you can go really fast after that. That's brilliant. Yeah. 
No, that's fantastic. And I'll tell you, you know, it seems like you guys are just, you know, crushing it and doing it all completely correct when it comes to, you know, identifying your audience, speaking to your audience and, and aligning sales, marketing support, everything else. And that's just a customer expectation nowadays. You can't, we're in a world now where, you know, if you're not doing it, then you're behind, but you guys have been leading the way, but I'm really curious to something specific around culture and how do you do that internally, right? Because yes, you've managed to uh, create the CX alignment, um, but internally you have distributed teams um, that are constantly focused on different parts of the business. How do you do the same thing that you're doing for your customers internally? It's a great question. I couldn't agree more with you that the bar is really high. Like people are bringing their consumer experiences and have the same expectations for mm -hmm. B2B experiences. And it's like night and day. So the ease of use of, you know, a, uh, an Uber Eats or a, uh, you know, any number of applications in the business world, the apps aren't quite as new and shiny. You know, that's why I was thinking, Paul, you're talking about the, the phone line, the cord and the fax yeah. machine and the dial. Like, I think a lot of B2B um, software uh, does not respect the high bar that exists now that people, mm -hmm. you know, just assume. Um, so uh, one of the benefits of distributed teams um, is of course, you can get a higher quality of person. So I'm from Boston and up until this job, I largely recruited in Boston and I know the talent market, which is good, but I couldn't get someone from Facebook or Amazon or someone from one of these companies that I wanted. And so I think you can go to a larger talent pool, which really matters. The one team that I think mostly struggles with the strip distributed uh, work is the BDRs, the SDRs. Mm -hmm. So these are typically young men and women, a year or two out of school. You know, they're in a pod, they're yelling and screaming, they're dialing. It's a tough job. You know, it's like do me push-ups. They got the bell, you know, they're listening to somebody. And there's really a lot of energy that goes into that. And the beautiful part about this, this pod of SDRs or BDRs is they learn from each other. They take mm -hmm. energy from each other. They listen like, wow, Paul said that on the phone. I'm going to try that. Or Javier is a, is a soft talker. Like, let me listen to his approach. He's really soft and people come in and he's closing business. He's getting meetings. So um, it's really important to, um, that team is really a struggle. So we have to spend more time onboarding them and training them, uh, which is a real, a real challenge. Um, so those are some of the thoughts about distribu distribution. Um, it does require a lot more meetings. You know, sometimes if you're in an office and you walk around the halls, you can accomplish like 12 things in a 10 minute walk around. And, uh, and if you're distributed, it's just kind of a burden of getting on video calls all day. I'm sure you guys face it all the time. It's, it can be challenging. We try to mix it up, obviously phone calls. I try to do walks outside. I block time in my day. And we just moved to a uh, no meeting Wednesday policy. Okay. We want um, people just burdened with so many meetings and sometimes you just have work and you wanna be heads down and focus on it. So we're going to see how that works. I know other companies are working on things like that because of Zoom fatigue and other phenomena that we're seeing. Yeah, yeah. there's a couple of folks from our company that are listening in right now that right now are probably just like doing fist bumps because <laughs> we, were, we were really talking about this recently about how do we do that, right? Because of the Zoom fatigue and because we're constantly communicating, uh, sometimes you're literally rolling from one meeting to another yeah. back to back and it doesn't give you time to just really sit there and marinate in your thoughts and, and just... Uh, consume and, and absorb everything that just happened for the past hour. So, uh, so I think that the no meeting day or figuring out a way to just balance uh, the meetings to the actual work time is extremely important. And yeah, so again, I'm sure that there's people over there just well, the here's period. the fist bumps. You yeah, know, yeah, I also yeah, exactly. agree. You know, I was all excited when we announced no meeting Wednesday. <laughs> And then uh, there were a couple of exceptions, like except for people who talk to customers, yeah. you know, which is me, and except for the executive team, like that's a good day for the executive team. So suddenly this Wednesday, I thought the Red Sea was going to part and I was going to have a beautiful Wednesday. And now it's all jammed in there Wednesday. So I'm a little disappointed. But you know, also, you know, I block a lot of time in my calendar and I never set up our meetings. They always have 45 minute meetings and I leave 15 minutes because one of my greatest fears, and it sounds like you guys may be similar, is follow-up. Like such a big part of our job and to trust and credibility is after a meeting ends, I don't know about you, but I got a bunch of things I got to do. And uh, I think both of you have like notebooks or something, don't you? Are you old school? Hold up your notebooks. Thank you. 
Yeah, nothing digital yeah. for this crowd. It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the digital yeah. team, no digital. Yeah, I got like a collection of pens over here. Like, you know, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, here's my collection of, uh, I got the pens and the old school stuff. <laughs> but it's, um, there's a lot of evidence that um, cognitive memory uh, is benefited by physical contact with things. So that's why you mm -hmm. guys like paper. That's why you like to take the yellow thing and highlight it. Um, you know, so it's really important to write doodles on there. I find that if I'm totally digital, my memory is not nearly as strong. I think I just different colors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, just, you gave me a swag idea. I think we're going to get launch pocket protectors, man, and just send those around. I think that we're right. Kick it old school. I'm telling you, we got to go back to it. Uh, and I, that might be better than the fanny packs you were thinking about. Well, you know, yeah, they, they came back. So yeah, it worked out. Um, hey, real quick, I know we're coming up to uh, some time here where we, we like to leave time for Q&A, uh, but I have one more question before I hand it over to Shannon, and that is um, this, the, the talk around community. And with you uh, envision having, what was it, 7 million? Yeah, users? we have 7 million people use our product. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a really large community. Um, yeah. We talked a couple of weeks ago with Steve Dinker about fandom while he was at uh, Turner Classic Movies, and it seems like there's this there's this commonality between these these fan bases, and I can imagine with product design and everybody using your um, your platform and solution that that they are becoming fans in some way, shape, or form of your of your service um, and your, your product. So what is it about community that you all um, kind of focus on or how do you leverage it? Or, uh, you know, what is it that your team is doing around community? You know, and I would even add to that, I would say, and has this fandom been by design or did it happen organically? Yes. Right? Yeah. The, um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, buyers would um, talk to the salesperson, they would um, go to the website. But I think now, because uh, they can connect with people on LinkedIn and elsewhere, um, they're getting personal references on choices they're making. Gartner and Forrester don't have quite the power they used to have, and it's like power to the people. Mm -hmm. And so you got to make sure that the community is there to provide a positive reference, have a good experience. And so as we look at the influences on why people make choices in software, uh, community ends up being number one. They're looking for credible people in their community in similar positions who are saying, use Envision or use Eloqua or use Marketo or whatever the product is. So that really matters a lot. Um, we've been pretty explicit about community. Um, we have a group called the Design Leadership Forum and it's by invitation only. And there are 3,500 people in the world who are design leaders at Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Walmart. And these people are a little bit isolated. You know, they don't get to talk to their peers as much and they're looking for connections. And so we provide that. I think what's really important uh, for me in community is you never shill for your product. You have to really help the community mm -hmm. and you have to have the belief that it's gonna come around at some point and benefit you. You know, I, I, I don't like the word marketer here sometimes. I think marketers see community as an opportunity to plug your product. But I found from my experience that when you are selfless and you help people in the community, that it comes back. So we help people get jobs. Um, we have something called a design forward fund. We've, we have $5 million and every year we give out money to, um, to certain organizations, could be diverse, people of color, uh, people who are out of work, not-for-profit organizations. And we expect nothing in return. We have that money available uh, to help the community. And I think the community knows that. And we have a design leadership forum for people uh, at... Uh, so those things really matter uh, a lot to us. That's, That's fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, That's really good. And, and, and real quick, let, if I can, let me make a little plug because that was somewhat of a loaded question because I, I truly believe that as well. Um, I lead a community effort here in Atlanta with the Atlanta Interactive Marketing Association. It's the same, uh, same thing. And when, when COVID hit, uh, we ended up propping up a, uh, a Slack channel or a Slack community for all the marketers here in Atlanta to, to, to stay connected. 
and define, you know, whether it's fine jobs, whether it's uh, troubleshooting um, for social. There was somebody that actually chimed into the community today that said their Twitter ad wasn't working and it wasn't loading. And, and somebody immediately jumped in and started helping. And that, that to me is, it really does uh, a kind of fuel my soul in many ways. And I love seeing other people succeed. So um, I really, really, really um, applaud your efforts there. Absolutely. It's, you know, and it, um, this idea of uh, people in the community answering other people's questions is just so valuable. When I was at Eloqua, we set up a community and uh, people would ask questions and it was an open community called Topliners and people would ask questions. And before we could even respond, people in the community responded with much more relevant answers. And the beautiful part was, of course, Google's looking at all this. Yeah. And so Google's seeing recency, relevancy, how many people, and so the beautiful benefit is your organic search results come way, way higher. And so it can benefit you. So this is what I mean by you do good by connecting people. The mm -hmm. community wants to help others and answer questions like the Twitter ad isn't loading. Uh, people answer that question. And now Google sees that there's lots of stuff going on and you come up higher in, in the rank. Yeah. So it's, I think it's a virtuous cycle. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, future of when we start talking about community. I'll tell you that we did some work with Autodesk some years ago to help them evolve their support. Um, and what they found and what we found during our research was that um, a lot of their users weren't going to Autodesk for very specific support because it wasn't specifically about how to use a product. It wasn't about how to use CAD. It's yeah. about, I'm, I'm, I'm designing a bridge in CAD. So I'm not gonna ask the software company, I'm gonna ask the peer. Yes. So I gotta figure out how to, get, how to get that conversation going. And they made some investments, significant investments into getting those communities going and real-time peer-to-peer stuff. It's been massively successful. And I think that you're gonna see, you know, obviously like what you guys are gonna see a lot more of that, but not only that, but reinvesting into that community, which you guys are obviously doing. So that's just something that's, you know, the future of communities and how it works. It really is, has to be that, that's, that continuous cycle, right? That's not only what, can, what, how do we connect you guys, but what else can we do to support you? So yeah, hats off to you guys for doing that really early on. You know, That's there really are some interesting issues with community. Like every once in a while, someone will say in the community, like, hey, I'm looking for an alternative to Envision. Who are their competitors? Who do you recommend? And it's like, oh man, we set up this community and our CEO and I have different points of view. Like he wants to shut it down and like burn them in effigy, whatever that means. Uh, for me, it's just let it go. Just yeah. let it out there and show generosity. And sometimes people pile on and, hey, Envision's really great at this. Have you tried this competitor? Not as good. I find the conversation being very healthy. Yeah. And also it, it shows that we're self-confident, that we're willing to host that conversation. But I will say it's, uh, I, sometimes I get uh, a little shaky when I, I see things being discussed that I'd rather not have discussed. Yeah. yeah. But that, that also, you know, that's the glass half full. If somebody's chiming in and saying that, that's an opportunity to find out why they're yes. even considering. And so then that goes back to that kind of diversity of thoughts and maybe that war room that you're talking about. And like, wait a second, we, we missed a gap here. And, and right. so that helps identify and just make everything better. So anyway, that's... Uh, that's my two cents and nobody came to listen to my two cents. Well, that's really valuable. I'm going to think about that because that really matters, right? We're listening to the conversation yeah. in a transparent way. People are saying who are the competitors? People are chiming in. What an amazing opportunity it is to learn from the community, like where you're falling short or mm -hmm. why they're even thinking about alternatives. I love that, yeah. Paul. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, well, I know we are, th this has been uh, a really great conversation and we're not done yet, but we want to make sure we give you your time back. Um, Shannon, I think now's a great time to jump on, see what we have from the community, our own community, um, and ask a few more questions. Well, my first takeaway is we're getting launched fanny packs. I'm so excited. <laughs> like, I love a good fanny pack. I'm not going to lie to you. So I'm bringing it. I'm all about it. I will wear it proudly. My kids make fun of me, but when I walk my dogs all day. Um, so going back to my notebook where I've been taking ideas for questions, <laughs> things that I want to ask you, um, <clears throat> I'm going to start there. I always like to selfishly ask some questions of my own. Um, so on this idea of community, um, I love this angle that we're going down. Um, we're using community right now on my own team to dis, uh, decide on a social publishing tool. And we've been going out and scraping reviews and, and doing comparisons. So yeah, very, very real. And that's kind of segues into my topic, which is 
B2B buying trends. Um, when we were talking last week, um, or I guess it was this week, um, we were talking about how B2B buying behavior has changed. And you said one of my favorite quotes, which was, um, COVID has leveled the playing field for sales. And now all of a sudden, as everything's kind of changed, there's like opportunity um, for marketers to really get it right. And we talked um, to go back to Hav's, you know, exciting topic of AI and bots. Um, how has that kind of worked together? You know, are people prefer to talk to a bot now in the early stages of buying because they're getting better information? You know, where do you feel that um, buyers are really getting the bang for their buck out of that? One of the highest returns we're seeing is solving a problem that I call the curse of abundance. Ooh, and, I already um, like it. Yeah, I know you like it. <laughs> well, you're a marketer, so you would appreciate this, Shannon. But the curse of abundance means, you know, sometimes you run an event and you get a ton of leads in one day and you don't have enough people to follow up on the leads. Mm -hmm. So all the evidence suggests that SLAs, service level agreements, old school would be, I'll get back to them in a day or a couple of hours. All the data suggests that you have to get back to a lead or a hand raiser or contact us within minutes, within minutes. So if you run a webinar and 50 people say, contact me, and you can't get to them for a day, you really missed an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So that's a great example where a bot can immediately respond to people and say, thank you for your interest. And these bots, there's many different solutions. One's called Conversica. I'm not an investor. I don't have anything. You guys have probably seen it. But they've got really good technology where they'll crawl through your email and they'll respond in a very human way. Hi, I'm Natalie. I'm on the sales team. You know, I'm a bot. Sometimes you admit you're a bot. Sometimes you don't. And if you want to talk to a salesperson, click here. We'll get it scheduled. Here's a video of our product. Thank you for your interest. And then uh, one thing I love about Natalie the bot is Natalie never takes a vacation, you know, and <laughs> Natalie responds in minutes. So even someone who sends an email at two in the morning, Natalie will, res will respond to that email at 2.01 in the morning. You know, you can imagine we've got humans, but they're in time zones. So how do you get very fast response, particularly with all the data that suggests that minutes matter to people who want to speak to you? Once they're going somewhere else, you know, their mindset is different. You sort of lost them. So minutes really matter. So that's a great use case for AI and bots. The other use case, if I could mention, is you know, we all know that open rates and click-through rates on emails are down. We all know that spam, people aren't picking up the phone call or we're so, you know, so what is getting through? How do you break through the clutter? And speaking of old school, Paul, I'm looking at you. Um, I'm thinking direct mail. Like if I mail something to them, but how do you get their home address? And so what we've done is uh, there's a little company called Alice, A-L-Y-C-E, and all you have to do what we found is that direct mail, if it's personalized, is very valuable. So all you have to do in Alice is put in a prospect's email address. It matches your social profiles. It crawls through your photos, like it crawled through my Facebook photo and found a picture of me with my dog and my kids. And it valued that photo very high because it had a high number of likes and comments. So the recommendation was for BarkBox, which was like a box of stuff for your dog, mm -hmm. you know, little play things and some, some uh, treats and stuff. And so uh, the way this works is um, you'll get an email with a personal URL with a Pearl you, uh, saying that, you know, the rep, you know, Shannon has chosen a gift for you. You go in there and there's some very relevant gifts or choose a different gift. And once you, and so you don't have to pay for the gift unless the person selects it. And then they have the gift with a personalized note from the rep. And we've high, seen very high conversions. People obviously feel guilty accepting a gift without never having talked, spoken to the, um, the gift giver. So we've seen, uh, Shannon, AI in those two ways. One is Natalie the bot responding very quickly to emails in a very human way. And secondly, how do you scale gift giving you know, at, a, at scale? I remember when I told my BDRs to go into Facebook and start looking and personalizing gifts, I walked in the pod when my other company where we actually had an office, they, everyone was on Facebook. And I'm thinking, oh my God, just spending <laughs> what hours doing? trying to find a gift. That's when you don't want and the so CFO I, to walk by. <laughs> that's when you don't want the CFO to see everyone's goofing around. They're on Facebook. Right. So that's why scaling this personalized gift giving can be super valuable. But there are that's, dozens and dozens of great applications for AI now. That, that is a, Those are two really great case studies. Really my follow-up question really was going to be, you know, what advice do you have for marketers that are early in the process of trying to figure out where to plug these kind of tools in. And I think those are, those are two really great case studies.
Yeah, mm -hmm. it, it usually helps when you have a problem you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. If you just talk to every vendor, let's face it, we all have seen that architecture slide with the 8,000 MarTechs out there with the logos you can't even see. You know, you don't have enough hours in the day to talk to every vendor. But in our case, we had two specific problems. How do we deal with the curse of abundance? Too many leads, we can't respond fast enough. And the second problem was how do we scale gift giving? So I find don't talk to every vendor in the world enough hours, but if you have specific problems, there probably is a MarTech out there that can help you solve it. Yeah. I, that is actually, I think, one of the most insightful things that you've said today, and there's been a lot, but I, I think that's a really good segue into a question from the audience, um, from Aaron, who wants to know, are you using any marketing automation platforms to really help connect all of these pieces together and power the machine? So with that idea of the problem you're trying to solve in mind, you know, what, what kind of, you know, advice do you have for someone like Aaron who might be vetting platforms? Yeah, so there are lots of really good marketing automation platforms. You know, you think about different parts of your organization have a system of record. So the sales team has a CRM, probably Salesforce. Finance is using, you know, uh, maybe, you know, whatever NetSuite or something. HR has an HR system. You need a system of record for marketing. And it's boiled down to basically four vendors at the low end for um, small businesses. It might be HubSpot. That seems to be pretty good. I think for more robust organizations that are professional, you're looking at Marketo, Eloqua, and Pardot, which is part of Salesforce now. Marketo is part of Adobe, and Eloqua is part of uh, Oracle. Uh, so really all good solutions, depending on what you want. But what I found, it's not just what automation tool you buy, responding to you, Aaron, it's how you configure it. So uh, we recently, about a year ago, I joined the company, we we're using HubSpot, but we have a 7 million database, so HubSpot didn't really scale for us. Um, and so we went with Marketo and there was some latency. So when someone fills out a form Marketo, I want to immediately see that in Salesforce. Like if the rep finds out 15 minutes later, it's too late. Mm -hmm. So you have to really fine tune it. So I think Aaron's choice is not just what platform you're buying, but how are you configuring it to make sure it works with all these other tools and dealing with things like latency. So we sort of hypercharged it up, you know, sort of an aftermarket and to make sure that it's almost instantaneously. So within seconds of someone filling out a form and submitting the form, the BDR can see that they did that in, 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 um, in, in CRM, in Salesforce. That's, that's fascinating that, that now the expectation is for us to really get that immediate response, right? Like we've now been conditioned to get an answer quickly. The idea of waiting I'll get back to you tomorrow. Forget about it. I've already moved on. You're exactly right. But the default in Marketo is a, they do it by batch. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't know that they batch it every 15 minutes, you won't know to say each one I want sent over immediately. And you have to do some other things in the back end. So I agree. The immediacy really matters. And this is a competitive advantage. Like there's good, better, best. And so, you know, good marketers have got to configure They're batching. They can see it. Best means it's coming instantaneously, you know, immediately. The other one is people on your website. Like if someone's on your website, I want to know now they're on the website. Right, right. Now, if I learn 15 minutes from now, their mind is, is they're thinking about their vacation, they're thinking about their kids, but when they're on your website, and so those are the kinds of things you want to know immediately. Now it could be creepy. Of course. And if, 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 if you're on someone's website and while you're on the website, you get a phone call or an email from a yeah. BDR that says, hey, Shannon, I see you're on the website. I'd love to talk to you about our solution. Do you find that good marketing or do you find that creepy? Really creepy. Like yeah. at least give me a minute to get off the site, you know? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. There's a product called uh, Lucky Orange that does that. And it's really inexpensive, but you can see people on the site and, and you can literally type to them, not call them, but... You can say, hey, I see that you're looking at this article. Can I help you with something? And it's really creepy. I would totally abandon. Like, what else are you watching? Are you captain? You know, whatever. But you did give me a business idea. Um, and when you talk about conversational bots, I want to create one that responds to my mother's text messages, but in Spanglish. You, think <laughs> we can be, you know, like 17 a day at minimum for family. Like, we got to create something like that. I will say, Natalie, the bot speaks about six different languages, which is fascinating. So we've got leads in, in French and Portuguese and Spanish and German and Dutch. And Natalie is really great. Imagine great. having to have BDRs who are multilingual. That's a real challenge. So that's one of the advantages of AI as well. They can respond in local language. 
That's one thing I thought. I don't know I... about your mother's. Uh, it's <laughs> English. I, I don't know if they're programmed for that. We'll work it out. He's, he's going to go build it this weekend. Um, <laughs> So kind of coming back to that point, though, and then I, what I really liked about what you said, a lot of marketers think about the platform, but then they don't necessarily budget for the time and the money that it's going to cost to do that level exactly. of configuration and customization. You know, I went through the same thing. I did a transition off of HubSpot to Salesforce and Marketing Cloud. Yeah. And, you know, there's the cost of the tool, but then there's sometimes as much cost to get it the way you want it and, and needing to know that you got to work with a partner sometimes to do it because you can't do it yourself fast enough. Exactly. I think that's a mistake. I think a lot of marketers make without budgeting that time and, and finance. Piece I of see, it. Exactly. Shannon. I've seen that over and over again, they budget for the software and not for the services to make it really hum. Mm -hmm. That's a big mistake. Yeah. Well, so I want to go back to your conversation about the CFO. I loved this. Okay. So, I, my past company, we were owned by private equity and we got a new CEO and CFO within a matter of just a couple months. And I figured out right away that if I was buds with the CFO, I was going to be doing well when you have to report up to private equity, right? Um, so in an environment where sales and marketing aren't integrated the way that you are, and your marketer may be doing a really good job of uh, reporting on some of those metrics but maybe they're not as aligned with their sales leader. Do you have any advice for folks who might be in a situation where maybe sales is doing the typical undermining of, of you know, marketing's metrics and effectiveness in an environment like that? That's a, that's a humdinger question. So I that's apologize, but it just, you know, it just came to me and I thought, man, I think this is something we all deal with in our career. You know, have you dealt with it and, and you know, did it go well or not well? Yeah, a classic question at the board, they want to show, they want to see if sales and marketing are pointing fingers and are blaming each other. Mm -hmm. So they'll ask a question like, hey, Brian, you know, or the CMO, like, uh, you know, how do you think the sales team is responding to leads? And and they'll ask the sales team, you know, how much your pipeline is marketing giving you all the loaded questions? Oh, yeah. I've been and in the room for those questions. Yes. <laughs> and so you got to really work on your script ahead of time yeah. and you got to show real alignment for preservation. The other thing with PE firms is um, I've never worked uh, for a portfolio company of a PE firm, but I'm very familiar with others who have. One good thing is to find other portfolio companies that have been in the portfolio for a while, talk to the CMO and the head of, uh, of, of sales and find out what do they like? What do they like to see? What are their dashboards? What are the metrics? So it's nice to get a little head start. Some PE firms like you know, have a very prescribed uh, playbook. You know, Vista is a great example. Um, others a little bit more, you know, come as you go. But I think it's important to really understand what they're looking for. Um, some of them really do want to hear about leads and conversion rates. Most want to know pipeline. Um, so I think it's important to demystify what the private equity firm is looking for and to have a common story with the head of sales. Um, it's great so advice. It can't be any finger really pointing or blaming. In real time, particularly, it can just, it, it's really bad to see. I, I've been in a couple of places where I've seen that. I'm on the board of a public company and a few other companies, and I've seen that happen. And it's just devastating. You lose complete confidence in both leaders. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So Erin said, thank you. You gave her some really great insight. And she's curious to know, what are some exciting things coming in the Envision product roadmap? Oh, wow. Thank you, Erin. Yeah, um, I know. I mean, she oh, teed that question, right up Aaron. for you. I know. Well, that's why I went ahead and asked it because I knew you were going to give him the opportunity. I think it's better when it comes from the audience. So that's fantastic. <laughs> you know, one thing that uh, we're finding in the distributed world that everybody needs is a virtual whiteboard. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about you, but if I see a pen and a whiteboard in an office, I pick it up and it's the way you communicate. But in Zoom, how do you really do that? So we have an amazing whiteboard, virtual whiteboard. Uh, that's going to be launching very soon. It's been out in the market for a while called Freehand. Mm -hmm. And anybody can pick up a pen and just start collaborating. And it's quite wonderful. And you can do reactions and there's sticky notes you can put on it. You can put photos and it's really wonderful. So look out for Freehand. We're going to have a big launch early June. And uh, we got some other things that are going on. You know, part of what we want to be is a system of record for design. As I mentioned earlier, sales has Salesforce and marketing has Marketo or Eloqua or HubSpot and finance has something, but in the world of design, it's fragmented across so many different things. You know, the engineer team is using Jira and maybe the product designers are using, you know, Sketch or Envision or something. And uh, so we want to unify all that and be a, uh, a, a single source of truth for all the people working on product design. 
So that's what's coming down the road a little bit later this year. That's uh, really exciting. Yeah. Like for us specifically, like that's really exciting stuff. Thank you. Shannon and I will be whiteboarding together uh, yeah. quite, a, quite a lot. <laughs> See hers in the background. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> I can't well, listen, function without it. <laughs> yeah. Brian, um, I know we're coming up to time again. I, I keep saying that. But um, one thing that we like to do with our guests is give them a quick opportunity to uh, either give a shout out to anybody that's helped them throughout the career or um, any specific podcast books, anything that, that, that you would want to throw over the fence to our audience as inspiration. I'll do that. Um, something that I found incredibly helpful is I've always had my own personal board of directors. So there's six people, some of which are CEOs, some are heads of marketing at bigger companies. And whenever I'm thinking about doing something, I have my own personal board and I talk to them about it and they've known me for years and uh, none of them are competitive with what Envision's doing. And they've been incredibly helpful. And I think sometimes marketers, you know, have their own opinions, but I love to bounce things against my own board of directors. They don't know they're my board of directors, but there's <laughs> six people that uh, I've known for a long time and I really respect. And so I would encourage others to find a group of people. Like one person on the board of directors is Megan Eisenberg. And uh, Megan was CMO of MongoDB and the head of marketing at um, DocuSign. And now she's head of marketing at TripActions. And uh, she's someone I've known for a long time. She was an early customer. And she and I talk a few times a year about wacky things and what are you thinking here and what's happening here. And she's been a wonderful uh, partner for me and my board of directors. Another guy is the head of marketing at Pendo, a guy named Joe Chernoff. And uh, he's part of my board of directors. And I talk to him all the time about things I'm doing. So I'd love to have that. So that would be my advice. Um, you know, there are a lot of great books and everything and podcasts, but I find that uh, real-time communication with uh, your own group of people that kind of know you, it's more personalized mm -hmm. uh, kind of information. And, uh, and also, as we were talking earlier, all these thousands of marketing technologies, I don't have time to look at them all. So with this board of directors I have, I very often say, Hey, what's new? What's cool? What are you using? Right. It's almost like a drug dealer. Like, hey, what's going on here? Hey, check it out. Check it out. So that's what the group is. They, they say, hey, yeah. I'm, I'm doing a beta of this cool technology. Look what it does. Yeah. And I just love getting the inside track. So I feel I have a little competitive advantage with this board. That is that is so smart. I, I, I've, I've written down a lot on my old school. Yeah. Um, having a personal board of directors, that is, I, I've never heard that. And that is actually brilliant. I, I absolutely love that. And um, I'm going to go seek out and create one uh, <laughs> yeah. myself. That is awesome. That's awesome. I, I will give a plug for a really great asset that Envision has. And I would recommend that everybody go and get it. It's the, uh, the Envision Design Ops uh, Handbook. Oh, um, and uh, and we pulled it down just like doing some exploration. And the design out, it's a, it's a you know, PDF. It, it just yeah. really goes through design operations. And it's really, really useful anybody who's in the business, like I would highly recommend you guys download it and read through it. So, uh, so yeah, great, great asset. Um, Brian, we just can't thank you enough for being a part of our tiny little show with your massive credentials and experience, man. We really, really appreciate you being a part of this. We're humbled by it. And, uh, and, you know, thank you again. Uh, we look forward to seeing all the great things that you guys are doing at Envision and, and hope to, to connect with you again very soon. This was a complete pleasure. Thank you so much for your generosity. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. And everyone who's still online with us, uh, we're going to put this episode on YouTube next week. So, so you guys uh, can listen to it again, take your notes, uh, share it with your network, and then uh, please take a moment to fill out a survey that's going to show up once you close out Zoom. Uh, since uh, we're constantly trying to improve the show and we want to listen uh, to you guys, our audience, to better understand what you, who you, who you want to hear from, uh, what kind of topics should we be talking about. So uh, please do take a moment. And then we have another show in two weeks. And Paul, who do we have on that show? Yeah, Friday, May 7th, we'll be joined by Paige Farrow. She's Senior Director of Marketing at Charbroil. Um, Paige is a talented marketing executive with nearly 20 years of experience uh, in marketing with craveable brands such as Coca-Cola, Diet Coke, and like I said, Charbroil um, right now. She's uh, leading digital marketing and e-commerce uh, for Charbroil, Charbroil, and she also leads brand development, uh, social, mobile, 
I, again, I think we're going to sh be sh uh, sh we're going to have probably three or four page pharaohs showing up. I don't know how <laughs> everybody gets all of this done, uh, but we're really excited to talk to her in two weeks. Plus, it's National Barbecue Month. Um, so that kind of makes sense with uh, Charbroil. So everybody can get fired up with America's favorite grill brand. Nice. Like yes. I see what you did there. Yes. Good job. Yeah. So anyway, and also please tune in on, on Speed Bump Social as well. Uh, Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, we'll be posting again Brian's amazing advice here next week. So uh, thank you again, Brian. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, thank team. you. Yeah. We'll send your fanny sure. pack soon. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.